I can just say that you have to surrender yourself to that film. And at some point midway, you do. You develop patience. I'm delighted to be here uh, with Carl Safina, uh, writer, naturalist, ecologist, founder of the Safina Center, and a neighbor uh, who lives not far away. So when I saw this film, I thought about Carl. And I'm a huge fan of this book that he has written, Beyond Words. So some of my questions quote the book. Uh, I frame them around the book. So, Carl, in your book, Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel, you say that a barrier between humans and animals is artificial because humans are animals. Further, you say that in our estrangement from nature, we've severed our sense of community of life and lost touch with the experience of other animals. Can you talk about that? Uh, sure, I'll try. Well, first of all, I thought that was an enormously powerful film, which just sort of swept me up like a giant surprise wave. And I've read a little of the book. The book is um, really, really beautifully crafted. The words are incredible. Uh, you got a little bit of a taste of that from the narration. So um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to say. Uh, you know about the question about our our strange dual existence. We we are animals who seem to hate the fact and the idea that we are animals and. Um, and the idea of who we are and where we came from and who we're related to. I don't know why exactly, I don't know why exactly that is. I, I love the fact of who we are and where we came from and who we're related to. I, I love feeling connected to, um, you know, the rest of the world, but we've, largely chosen, our culture is largely predicated on choosing a nasty divorce. Um, there, are, there are cultural roots to that and they're really peculiar to, to our culture, the Western culture. They are, those feelings and those values are extremely different from many other major cultural realms in the world and, and throughout time. Indigenous people see it very, very differently. Uh, in South Asia, the, the Dharmic religions see it very differently. The philosophies of the East see it very differently. And one thing that all of those views have in common and have had in common throughout human history is that we are part of the world. Only in the West do we try to insist that we're not part of the world. And the result is a planetary catastrophe that we're perpetrating and suffering. Well, I think you elaborated on that. I'm going to jump over one of my questions, Carl. OK. And the imperfect one. OK. Um, you think and you write a lot about the relationships between human and animals, and particularly in this book, Beyond Words. So I'm quoting you from the book. If cruelty and destructiveness are bad, humans are, by a wide margin, the worst species ever to infest this planet. If compassion and creativity are good, humans are, by a wide margin, the finest. But we are neither good nor bad. We are all these things together, and imperfectly so. The question for all of us is, which way is our balance trending? So can you elaborate further on what you mean by this and give us some examples? Uh, well, I think, you know, humans, humans are the most um, 
well, as it says there, humans are the, are the cruelest and most destructive animal ever, and we also are the most creative and most compassionate animal ever. But we, um, we don't really favor one of those uh, two dualities, you know, the good one. Uh, the, the creativity and the compassion is not the one that, um, on balance, the human enterprise throughout the world is favoring. It would be good if we did, and um, if we, you know, if we if we tried to agree to elevate the things that are most human in us, I would say it's the creativity and the compassion. So, you know, the raw materials for being something really magnificent are there. But we, we don't favor those most of the time. Or, or you know, you, you could argue that and say, well, we actually, we do favor those most of the time. But when we don't, the, I think that the, uh, you know, the cruelty and the destructiveness becomes so overwhelming that it, uh, it becomes one of the major hallmarks of our presence here on this planet, if if you would, if if it was possible to ask and get a measured reply from a member of another species about whether the presence of humans is a good or a bad thing on the planet, it would be very hard to come up with any species that find our presence to be helpful. There are a few. And the ones that uh, find us most helpful are the ones that we tend to really, really despise, like rats and uh, things like that. So, Carl, but you've traveled around the world, and can you, you, you've, I'm sure you've experienced compassion for that people have for animals. Can you talk about that a little with the elephants or some experience where you've you've seen compassion so exhibited? Well, in in any indigenous um, culture that is reasonably intact and still based on the land, there tends to be a lot of respect for the integration of life in the world and recognition of that. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you do see that if, if you're with people f from, with those kinds of roots who are still able to carry out more or less their original culture. And an interesting thing about that, I think, is that the cultural values seem to generally maintain themselves even after Western technology is introduced to them. Um, you know, so uh, like uh, the, the introduction of things like guns and motors and chainsaws and cell phones does not automatically flip indigenous values. Um, Entering the market economy, though, is, well, that's pretty much turning, a, turning your back on those land-based values. So that tends to be, uh, when that happens, all bets are off, in my, in my experience. Um, some of the people that I travel with are behavioral ecologists. They're people who, you know, the rare people who make a living watching wild animals, and um, I guess I could kind of say they're my favorite sort of people to be with, uh, because just like we saw in the movie, they, they watch very patiently and see very well. They, they have not only, I guess, a lot of talent for observation, but well-developed skills of observation as well. And, um, and they tend to be very nice. I, I, I like to be around people like that. And of course, if you're around people like that, you tend to be also in some of the most fantastic remaining places in the world. So those have, those have certainly been 
among my very, very most wonderful experiences. And, uh, you know, a lot of the ones I feel like it uh, becomes my responsibility to try to relate some of that in the course of the books that I write. That's why I go. So. There was one frame in that film, sort of three quarters of the way in, you know, there's a whole series of landscapes, these barren, barren landscapes and snow and rock. And the snow leopard's face was there. I, I mean, it was so, I turned to Deborah to, to, and there was no, no response, but there the snow leopard was, was just ca perfectly camouflaged, gray and white and black. It was just magnificent. It's just a, such a terrific film in terms of, you find yourself looking the way they're looking. You know, am I missing something? What do they see? It's extraordinary. Um, I have just one last question before we can open it up to people, and that's about endangered species. You know, the snow leopard is an endangered species. I don't know if it's listed as such, but what is happening to this planet that we are losing the magnificent magnificence that we see here? <laughs> well, I, I think it's obvious. We're not losing anything. We're taking it all. Well, and, um, you know, we're, we're just storming the world and, and uh, overwhelming it. That's what's happening. That's almost all the animals that are... Well, I, I don't even like talking about endangered animals because then we only look at the rare ones. But if you just look at the trends of populations, almost every living thing in the world is at its lowest population level now with major downward trends um, over the last couple of hundred years and, and accelerating recently. Um, you know, just the, there are there are birds uh, that live here or pass here in migration that are not considered endangered, but are vastly, vastly fewer than they were when I was in high school, let's just say. And the problem with worrying about endangered animals is that you don't see the declines that make them endangered. That's partly how we think about it and partly the law that we have because of how we think about it. So the Endangered Species Act doesn't do anything until a species completely out of context is known to be, shown to be suddenly, but not really suddenly, at very small numbers. And then you say, oh, it's endangered. Now we'll put it on a list. Now we have to figure out what to do since it doesn't have much of a place to live anymore or it's dying out because it's being poisoned. The couple of the other major, uh, major environmental laws that we have take an opposite approach. The Clean Water Act does not say, as long as you won't die from stepping in the water, it's okay. It, it says the water in the country is unacceptably polluted and we will now mandate that it must be, quote, swimmable and fishable. That's an aspirational target to a federal law. The Endangered Species Act does not have an aspirational target. It says the plane can be in free fall as long as it doesn't crash. But a plane that is in free fall will crash. So that's one of the reasons that we continue to have major declines with wildlife and uh, the need to put more and more species on an endangered species list. If we, if we had a law that said populations of living things must be maintained at levels that are s stable and viable or recovered, then we would have a very different situation. And we, of course, have a very different set of values being applied to the situation. We wait to the end point. That's for sure. Does someone have a question for Carl? Okay, do, just wait for a mic. Do 
you think the human species will become endangered? Mm. We are. <laughs> uh, well, there are, you know, there's a lot of reasons to, to say that we are endangering ourselves. Um, bubbles do burst. We're in an enormous bubble with some very dangerous trends. For instance, the, the, the thing about humans that climate change most threatens is our ability to create food. Because a lot of crops are much, much less productive at higher temperatures than how they're being grown right now. And, uh, and there are places where water is scarce that are, tend to be hot and dry. Hot and dry places are getting hotter and drier. So we, we you know, we're kind of like driving very slowly toward a cliff that is right there on our GPS, and we, we don't seem alarmed enough to take our foot off the gas, to mix a metaphor. Someone else is right there. Uh, it's more a comment than a question. Um, on the positive side, if you look around what has happened lately in the way of uh, talking to Aborigines in Australia, talking to our Indian population, and trying to find out what they did and how they are coping with fires, with shortage of water, and handling their land. I see a bit of a trend that we start to learn finally a little bit of what the indigenous people always knew, and we're now taking up some of these things. What's your comment on that? Yeah, I, I think indigenous people have values that could make the modern world work because they know a very important word, you know, they know the word restraint. And um, as I mentioned, it, th their values tend not to change through the, the um, introduction of modern technology. So I think that those values applied to modern technology would, would probably be wonderful. I think it would be um, the direction of solutions. The, the main problem is that very few people are interested in that and are paying much attention. But I do think that it is there, as, as I think you're indicating. And I think that we have uh, an enormous amount we could learn from those ancient values of those ancient cultures, where they remain intact, yeah. Another question for Carl? So do you have any hope? <laughs> Can you define hope for me before I define it for you? Well, beyond getting up in the morning and functioning, do you think that the most intelligent primates that we are, are going to be able to turn it around and, you know, not destroy the planet. Well, you're asking me to uh, make a prediction, but my, my definition of hope is the ability to see how things could get better. I, I think that hope motivates all work and I can't imagine why anybody would do anything if they didn't see um, how doing that thing would, would be better or would result in something good happening. So that's my definition of hope. And all of the problems that we are always talking about have very obvious solutions or at least we know how to improve the situation, even though uh, we could quibble a lot about many of the details, but we, we would certainly easily know what direction to move in on, I would say, well, all the problems that I ever seem to encounter or talk about, we kind of know what to do. So in that sense, I have enormous hope. Do I think people will pull it together 
um, becomes a different kind of a question. The question is, are human beings capable of fixing the problems that we are capable of making? We're obviously capable of causing global problems. We're not obviously capable of solving global problems. And that's, that's a matter of record so far. But because we know what we could do, I think there's a lot to work toward. That if I could also say, Carl, we have an example, a hope, an example of being hopeful with the osprey, you know? I mean, they were gone, and now they're everywhere because we figured it out. That's, that's very true, and that's one of the best examples. Uh, uh, it, something I actually often talk about is that when I was in high school, well, when I was 15 years old, there was an article in the New York Times Magazine and the title of the article, this relates to ospreys, but it's not about ospreys. The title of the article was, Death Comes to the Peregrine Falcon. And the, what the article was about was about the peregrine falcon is doomed. Nothing can be done. And it was doomed because of the DDT and the other hard pesticides that were making their eggs break, which is exactly the problem that ospreys had. It's why there was a giant eraser that wiped out almost all of the ospreys on this entire coast and most of the rest of the country. But um, people did get their act together on that problem and that allowed both of those birds to recover. Uh, you know, now, as you say, there are ospreys absolutely everywhere. And, uh, and also one of their main one of their main prey items, the, the menhaden, or the fish we like to call bunkers, have also recovered in about the last decade from restrictions that have been put on the catch that has allowed the, the population to explode. So this is a totally different coast than it's been for m most of my, well, my entire lifetime. We have schools of these fish that are 20 or 30 miles long in the summertime outside the surf. We have whales. The humpback whale is much more abundant now than it has been in the last two centuries. Um, and it has all this food, and the ospreys don't really even have to hunt anymore. They just go out and pluck their food. Uh, there are so many ospreys around right now that they're, they're unable to find the kind of nest sites that they prefer. And last year, for the first time, I saw m multiple osprey nests on the ground in, in marshes or, or on a little bit of washed up detritus in a marsh, like a you know, washed up oil drum or something like that. I, I saw probably half a dozen osprey nests that were either on the ground or not, not more than that high above the ground, because so many of them, they can't find their preferred nest sites. So that is really fantastic, and it's, it's really fantastic to see all these fish along the beach with um, all these different kinds of fish and birds and mammals making a living off of them. It's really a view of a coast that I had never really quite imagined. I, I didn't ever imagine that those fish could be that abundant and live at such densities, but there they are. So, so the fact that we did that um, should give us all a lot of hope, I guess, that the solutions are there, and sometimes things, things get dire enough and uh, a few people decide they won't take no for an answer, they do what's needed. So um, who knows? Who knows where we're headed and what will be happening? Well said. Any other questions from Carl? Yes, over here. So, you know, we're probably all concerned people here. We love animals and we would love to help the environment. Can you give us a couple of um, actual things that you would think ultimately would be helpful if we tried to do them? I mean, we all know, you know, recycling and, and things like that, but what would be your top two things that people could do now to save the planet, for example? Voting for the right people <laughs> and eating the right things 
are two big ones. Family size is a really big one. Those are probably the top three. We make various decisions every day about how we're going to be and what we're going to do. And they add up. If we are always trying to be better and thinking about it, then we're, we put ourselves more in a position to be part of the solution. And if we say, well, it's just me and what I do doesn't matter, we're unlikely to put ourselves into a position to be part of the solution. So yeah, so there are all, all of those kinds of things. But you asked me for two, I gave you three. <laughs> well, what, what you talk about, how, how you talk about it, everybody now has a platform. In a way, there's just too much because uh, we all talk to our own echo chamber a lot of the time. But, um, you know, there is that. There is uh, how, how you live, what, you know, how, how you approach your use of energy and uh, what you decide to drive, um, what you do for a living. You know, sometimes I, I speak to people who are making a decision about that, young people deciding what to major in or what, what values to bring into a decision about. Sometimes people change in mid-career or have a second career. And um, those are all opportunities. But I, I, think, I think it's important that we all individually think about how we could do things a little bit better. But um, that alone is not going to save the world. You know, changing your light bulbs alone is not going to save the world. But understanding that we, we have some effect on the bigger trends and paying more attention to the bigger things like who, who is in office and, um, and those kinds of things. Those are great takeaways. One last question, if there is one. Yes. Hi, thank you f for the uh, program. I don't have a question, actually, but I just want to offer a suggestion to this woman who asked what else you could do. Um, something very personal and doable is um, uh, reduce your lawn and replace it with all types of native shrubs, trees, grasses, uh, flowers, etc., which will help increase the bug population, which the birds need. The insect situation is really, um, it's changing very rapidly. Uh, you know, most people think that bugs are harmful and they eat leaves and you would imagine that they can just eat any leaves. But actually most insects, the reason we have such a diversity of insects is they're very finely adapted to particular kinds of plants and particular kinds of flowers. And insect populations are really, really falling. And um, the consequences for birds and for uh, just the continuity of plants is, um, is really major. So that's certainly one thing, um, and a big thing, and a whole, it's really a whole series of things. There are, there are lots of environmental groups, and they range from international groups to little local groups. They're all, they're all worth your consideration uh, as far as possibly you know, joining them and uh, supporting their work or being actively involved in some of the work. There's really lots and lots of different things that people can do, so. And what you also can do is be inspired by reading one of Carl's books there on the table in the back. I highly encourage you. I mean, this is my, one of my favorites, Beyond Words. But Carl tells me that there are three versions of this, two for kids and one for adults, is that? There, there is, um, there's a two volume young readers version of that book. Of this, yeah. but th this is for grown ups. So, um, 
come tomorrow to see River. It's the last film in the series of Doc's Equinox, and we'd love to see you again. And please join in welcoming and thanking Carl for a wonderful talk and for being here. Thank you all very much. It, it was a hum humbling honor to be able to say a few words after that magnificent film. So thank you. And